Before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge the presence of his wife, Barbara Ledeen, in the audience. And I have a special reason for doing that, uh, not only because of her wonderful children, her daughter who served in Afghanistan and, her, and Iraq, and her two Marine officer sons, but thanks to her work on Capitol Hill with the Republican Study Committee, no, con con Republican Conference Committee, I and some of my colleagues in the Pentagon uh, in the second Bush administration were able to do things for our country that we would not have been able to do had Barbara Ledeen not been there uh, to get the support for us to do those things. So I have few occasions in public to acknowledge her. <laughs> and, and thank her. Now, Dr. Michael Ledeen, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for many years, uh, is a freedom scholar at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. And he was at many, for many years at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a renowned scholar on Iran, Iraq, terrorism, and international security. Dr. Ledeen has served as a consultant to the National Security Council, the State Department, the Defense Department, and was a special advisor to the Secretary of State during the Reagan administration. I recall when I first went to the White House uh, to work on the White House Outreach Working Group on Central America, President Reagan had recently liberated Grenada. And one of the people assigned to study and analyze the papers uh, that were captured on Grenada by our troops was none other than Dr. Ledeen. So he came to the White House Outreach Working Group in the White House and made a presentation about what he had discovered and the significance of it. And there embedded in my memory forever was a phrase he used referring to the Cuban construction workers and their automatic repeating shovels. <laughs> Remember, Mike? Uh, Dr. Ledeen holds a PhD in modern European history and philosophy from the University of Wisconsin. He's taught at Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Rome, where he enjoys the cuisine. <laughs> Uh, he's the author of more than 35 books, so he is prolific, and those include um, Accomplice to Evil, Iran, uh, and the War Against the West, The War Against the Terror Masters, The Iranian Time Bomb, and other works. But what he is here to speak on tonight is the book that just came out a week ago, and I must report on Amazon Prime failure, because I ordered a number of copies and sadly got the news at the beginning of this week they couldn't be here before Wednesday. So I went to Barnes & Noble and bought all of the copies they had there, and I see they've disappeared from the sales table quickly. I'm sure Dr. Ledeen would be happy to sign those for you after his talk on the field of fight how we can win the global war against radical Islam and its allies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ledeen. Thank you, thank you. Um, everybody wants to know what's it like writing a book with a three-star general. And I wanted to know myself. Um, Flynn is really unusual, I have to say. He, um, I did dozens of interviews to uh, get ready to write this book with him, and I talked to people who worked with him, above him, beneath him, people who liked him, people who despised him, uh, you know, trying to figure out who he was and what he was and so on, because there's a whole section of field of fight that I call Growing Up Flynn, and 
uh, to me, uh, the real, if you want to understand Mike Flynn, and who knows what he's destined for at this point, Trump may win the election. If he wins the election, he may ask uh, General Flynn to do something. General Flynn might say yes, etc. Who knows? Uh, but the secret of uh, Flynn is, number one, Obama Flynn, and number two, growing up Flynn. He's one of nine children. They lived in a one-bathroom house in suburban Rhode Island, and all the kids had to be out the door at the same time. So I always tell people, you want to know what discipline's all about? <laughs> That's discipline. And uh, Mama Flynn was, uh, was uh, well on her way to a college degree when she got pregnant the first time. She was going to Brown. She stopped college, raised nine children. When the ninth child moved out of the house, she went back to college, got her degree, got a law degree. And uh, so she's an amazing woman, and he's an amazing man. And uh, uh, this book will explain to you how and why he and General McChrystal transformed American military intelligence, uh, first in Iraq, then in Afghanistan. And uh, when you finish reading it, you will probably ask yourself, as I asked myself, and then as I asked him, so how come we're not doing it anymore? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, he was gone. It's all about leadership. And uh, you know, the people who didn't entirely approve of what he was doing stopped it. And that's a big part of the story. This book argues that we are at war. It's a world war, a global war. It's everywhere. It runs from Pyongyang to Caracas, through the Middle East, which we all follow in agonizing detail, Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, Turkey to some extent now, uh, across Africa into South America, Venezuela, Honduras, Cuba, which everybody always forgets, by the way. Yeah, everybody forgets Cuba. And yet, Cuba's a big part of this story. So anyway, we are fighting against an alliance of radical Muslims and radical seculars. Putin is an enemy of ours and Kim Jong-un is an enemy of ours. They are not Muslims. They're bad guys. And they work with radical Muslims with a common goal of doing us in. But it's very important in his speech last night, of course, everybody's obsessed with uh, plagiarism from last night, but uh, in Flynn's speech, he said, we are fighting radical Muslims and failed tyrants. And that's what it is. We're, we're allied against these insane Muslim movements and failed tyrannies. Nobody wants to be the new North Korea. The rest of the world doesn't for a minute think that Putin, they were, how wonderful it would be if only they had Putin in their country. No, they may admire him for his ruthlessness. They may fear him for his meanness, but they don't really want to live in a place that he runs. So this is the war we're in. No, hardly anybody sees it. Hardly anybody talks about it. There's a lot of talk nowadays about radical Islam, and people have finally caught up with the censors in the White House and the State Department and the Pentagon and are beginning to say uh, radical Islam, radical Muslims, and so forth, and stop talking about workplace violence and other euphemisms. Uh, for terrorism. But it's not just that, and it's important to keep in mind that it's not just that. Uh, the important thing about that, about the radical Muslims, is that they are representatives of failed societies. It's a failed culture. Muslim culture is a failure, and they know it. My favorite fact toward in doing the research for this book comes from a study done maybe 10 years ago now by a bunch of Arabs at the United Nations about the Arab world. 
And in there, they report that more books have been translated from foreign languages into Spanish in the last year than into Arabic in the last thousand years. Let me say it again, because it sounds impossible. More books in the last year into Spanish than into Arabic in a millennium, in a thousand years. So we're dealing with a whole culture where they don't know anything. All they know is Koran and all these kids who were raised to be terrorists and fanatics and so forth. What do they do? They sit cross-legged on the ground in these little madrasas and their imam or their teacher comes by and they memorize the Koran. And if they don't get it right, their teacher wraps them you know, with a yardstick. I used to get wrapped with the yardstick back in the old days, but that was Massachusetts. That was different. So, so these people are desperate. And since they do not know really how to do any of the things that make a modern society modern, they take it out on us and they hate us. And there's finally the last point I want to make about them is that uh, sexual frustration plays a big role, uh, in my opinion, in the creation of radical Muslim terrorists. Because these madrasas are all boys. It's not a female within sight. And they are segregated by sex. And they go years on end through early adolescence <coughs> without women. It's all boys. And so they have these endless fantasies and so forth. It's not surprising that so much of the terrorism is aimed specifically against women and uh, against women who don't dress according to standards. And it's not a surprise to me that, that the Iranians are terrified of women and insist on women covering their bodies up and covering their heads you know why they cover their heads, by the way? There's nothing Quranic at all about head garb. Nothing. There's no religious requirement, no justification for it all. The Iranians believe that women's hair is the source of sexual impulses, and that if left uncovered from their hair, there come these terribly uh, corrupting waves of sexual energy which ruin the morality of the men. And so if the men misbehave, it's the women's fault because she didn't cover the hair because the rays were coming out, and that's how it happens. Interesting, huh? There's no, it has no religious standing at all. That's why if you travel around the Muslim world, you see places where they cover their heads and places where they don't. Places where they wear burqas and hijabs and so forth, and places where they don't because it all gets interpreted at various local levels. And finally, uh, there's an awful lot of talk about something called Sharia, Muslim law, rules, and so forth. Well, it turns out that you can't go to Barnes & Noble in Baghdad and buy a copy of Sharia. It's not there. Sharia, Muslim law, what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to behave, and so forth, varies from mosque to mosque. And the Sharia that you believe in and the Sharia that you practice is whatever your local imam tells you it is. And if you go online, for example, you can go online and you can look at all the famous ayatollahs, Sistani, Khamenei, Rafsanjani, so forth, and their websites are fatwas, that is religious judgments. People send them emails and say, well, what about oral sex? Well, you know, can I drink this after that and so on and so forth? And they give answers. Those answers are not the same. There's a huge variation. Those who think that suicide terrorism is okay, those, those who think that suicide terrorism is haram, must be forbidden under all circumstances and so forth. So there's a big diversity across the Muslim world. There is no central authority. There's no Vatican. There's no rabbinical council. 
There is none of that. There's just imam after imam after imam, and each one of them gives his opinion on all these issues. So it's a uh, very disjointed world of sexually frustrated, mostly young men, who are uh, desperate to show that they're worth something and that they can accomplish something and so forth. And their leaders have led them to wage war against us. And they've been waging war against us for quite a long time. Iran declared war against the United States in 1979. What's that? 37 years now. And they've been killing us since 1979. And they continue to kill us. And the hell of the situation that we're in is that not only can we not say radical Islam, but we have to use euphemisms for it, but we have an administration that somehow believes that the best thing the United States can do in this world is to make a strategic alliance with Iran. And the Iranians only want to kill us, destroy us, dominate us. And in this book, at a certain point, we ask, well, what if they win? Because at the moment, they're winning. Our enemies are winning. We're losing this war. And there is hardly a place on Earth where we are in a winning or potentially winning position. So what will happen to us? What will it look like? What if they win? And the answer is, uh, this place will look like Iran. Same sort of stupid rules, same kind of you know, women walking around covered, uh, music banned for the most part, certain degree of flexibility, but for the most part, uh, you know, ruthless, tough, oppressive Islamic society. So that's what we're fighting for. It's a war for the survival of Western civilization. And it's damn hard to find anybody who takes it seriously. I mean, when we talk about the jam that we're in right now, it's always talked about in terms of one place or another place. There's the Syria problem. There's the Iraq problem. There's problems in South America. There's Cuba. There's North Korea. North Korea test missiles and nuclear weapons and so forth. It is not seen. People do not think of it as a global conflict, as a single, unified effort to wipe us out. And yet that's what it is, and that's what we're facing. So how, did the, how do you win in a situation like this? Um, there's a lot in the field of fight about how we won in both Iraq and Afghanistan because in fact every time that we have gone after these terrorist armies seriously we have won we always beat them and you can tell that we beat them in Iraq for example after we beat them in Iraq uh, Al-Qaeda recruitment w dropped way down they were having trouble getting people and in Afghanistan the same sort of thing happened when our son Daniel was in Afghanistan. He was in Helmand province. Uh, it was a famous location because Prince, whatever his name is, Harry, William, uh, he was there, fighting there, and the Brits pulled him out because it was just too bloody. They didn't want to leave him there. And the Brits are good fighters, and they like to fight. So it's not like, say, the Germans who, who, who don't fight and in fact only recently have permitted their troops uh, in Afghanistan to engage the Taliban from time to time. No, no, it was real fighting and, uh, and they were getting killed in significant numbers. So the Brits came out of that neighborhood and uh, the Marines went in and then there was a rotation and uh, Daniel's guys went in. And Daniel spent eight months in that province, which had been so bloody that the Brits would not leave their troops there, looking for Taliban and couldn't find any. Couldn't find any. And they'd go from village to village and say, you know, have anybody here seen the Taliban? We're looking for Taliban. We'd like to talk to them. Where are they? And the answer was, they're all gone. 
they went to Pakistan. And we subsequently got uh, reports on the PACs about uh, talking to these Taliban and saying, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in Afghanistan? And the uh, Taliban said, you want to go fight the Marines? Go fight the Marines. We do not want to fight the Marines. There's a, there's a better way to spend your time. Uh, so we win. So when we go after them, we're superior to them. We fight better than they do. Our technology is vastly superior to theirs. And Flynn and McChrystal worked out uh, this amazing intelligence system. I'm going to talk about it for a couple of minutes because it's so interesting. And I spent an awful lot of time uh, figuring out exactly what it was and how it worked. And I hope and believe that in field of fight, I've got it in language that a normal person, a non-technical expert, a non-military person can understand. Basically, here's the story. Traditionally, the way uh, intelligence on the battlefield was done was you'd have intel officers out in the field and they would learn something. They'd write it up. It would go back to uh, one headquarters and then to another headquarters. Eventually, it would arrive on the desk of somebody who made strategic decisions. He would think about it and decide what was best to do, and then it would go back down the chain of command until it finally got back to the battlefields, and they would then do what the top guy decided need to, needed to be done. Hopeless in this kind of war. Hopeless. Because the enemy on the battlefield is hit and run, attacks you, and then goes, with the exception of recent times when ISIS uh, decided, no, they could control a lot of territory and hold it and stay there, and that will not work out well for them. But in any case, so Flynn and McChrystal said, okay, we've got to destroy these people. How do we do it? And over time, they evolved a system. It has a lot to do with technology, but primarily it has to do with the notion of eliminating the top guys from this flow of intelligence and the action on the battlefield. Because if you have to have the top guy approve and design and so forth, you can't do it fast enough. They got to a point where within hours, if they attacked an enemy base, let's say, on the battlefield, started interrogating people, somebody revealed information about locations where their comrades were hiding or planning or so forth. This was relayed in real time back to the chain of command, which then turned around and said to the people who were on the battlefield in that area, go to this location and attack this target. And it was less than 24 hours, this turnaround business. And the interrogations continued and the new attacks took place and the information from that got fed back into the stuff that had come from the first one. So they transformed, completely transformed the way we do battlefield intelligence. Revolution. And it worked. And we wiped out Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which was a very mean, very tough, and very smart organization. This book begins with, uh, with a, an operation that special forces made in Iraq where they broke into a house and they were hoping to find Sarkawi and other bad people. The, the bad people were gone, but they found documents and computers and so forth. And they started looking through it and discovered to their horror that these guys were very smart and very well informed. And they even had PowerPoints to explain what we were doing and what we were thinking and how our strategy worked. And what we had and what we didn't have and how to deal with the Americans and so on. And he said, oh my God, you know, we, they had no idea. And that is what compelled them to change the whole way their intelligence was done. So the argument of this book, after explaining all this and telling these various stories, is to say that the war we're in requires superior intelligence, and we are in an intelligence war. And unfortunately, our intelligence community is badly broken. That whole system that was put into place for Iraq and Afghanistan is gone. 
that uh, we don't have a battlefield on which to operate it, and the guys with stars on their shoulders, on their uniforms, uh, have come back and taken, retaken control over the process, so they want to see all the stuff, and they want to make the decisions, they want their name on the paper, and all of that, all the usual bad bureaucratic problems that you run into always. So, there it is. With this precedent, there is no hope of, of recovery. Can't be done. He doesn't care. In fact, he wants, what he wants is, of course, an alliance with Iran. When what we should want, above everything else, is the destruction of the regime in Tehran. What we should want is regime change in Tehran. How often do you hear anybody talk about that? You won't hear anybody talk about it at either of the two conventions. And you hardly ever read a line about it, no matter how much you read and how many websites you go to, and so on, people don't talk about it. And yet, <coughs> all the time, we see evidence that people in that part of the world are unhappy. They do not want to live in Islamic republics. They want to live more the way we live. I mean, look at this Turkey thing, whatever it was whatever it is. And I don't know yet, it's too soon. I'm an historian, so I take my time. I don't have a daily deadline or anything like that. Uh, I don't know what happened. There's a third of the Turkish people say they think that Erdogan staged the whole thing himself, right? Tricky, because that's a part of the world where people are tricky. And where being tricky is a virtue. Uh, did he do it? Can he do it? Is it possible? I don't know, but they're missing still. I checked before I came out here, they're still missing 14 <coughs> Navy ships, unaccounted for. What happened to them? Where did they go? Where are the crews? Where are the commanders? Were they part of the coup? Were they tricked and taken hostage? What? No one seems to know, or at least I can't find it online as yet. But in Iran, protests are constant and ongoing. And right now, there's quite a lot of fighting going on in the northwestern part of the country against Kurds. Because, the, you know, the Kurds are one group which is doing fairly well in all of this country. And they don't want to be part of Iran. I mean, the Kurds want this big Kurdistan in Iran, Syria, Iraq, and Turkey. And so, the, I mean, that part of the world is very, very explosive. And of course, we've got Putin. And remember that Putin is in that part of the world. Why? If you were to read the papers, you'd figure that he has some scheme. Yes, he has a scheme. He wants a warm water port. Russia has always wanted a warm water port. And, um, and Syria offers that. But he's there because the Iranians sent their armies, Hezbollah and the uh, Revolutionary Guards, into Syria to defeat Assad's enemy, and they couldn't. They were losing. And so General Soleimani went to Moscow and said to Putin, we're losing. Do something. Help us. And then Putin sent planes and troops <coughs> and weapons and so forth into Syria. That is why he's there. That's what forced him in there. So it's the scene of uh, this global war. But uh, the last point I want to make is don't permit yourselves to be distracted by what's going on in the Middle East. We're living in a world where something bad is going to happen almost every day. The terrorists and their state sponsors know that this wonderful thing that happened to them, Obama, is only going to be there another six months. So they've got six months where they can do more or less anything they want, and nothing bad is going to happen to them, because he's not going to do anything mean to them, because he wants to deal with Iran above everything else. He's even now talking to Putin about making a strategic alliance over Syria. Well, that'll preserve Assad, which in turn will preserve Khamenei. That's how all of that is working. So those guys, the terrorists, 
terrorist countries like Iran, terrorist organizations, whether it's the uh, Al Qaeda's or the ISIS's or the Al Nusra's or whatever it is. They're in a big hurry now. They're going to do as much as they can, as fast as they can, all over the place. And that is why you see terrorist activities everywhere from Nice to Paris to Brussels to Orlando to Dallas to so on and so forth. These people are all part of one horrible family who want to do us in. Uh, I, don't see, I don't know if this demonstration actually happened this afternoon, but it was a left-wing demonstration that was scheduled for Cleveland this afternoon. And you know, every evening at the Republican convention is called, let's make America safe again, let's make America strong again, and so on. And their rally was called, America never was great. It's just a pure anti-American rally. And I, we don't talk about it here, but I often ask myself, you know, what kind of help are they getting? During the Cold War, organizations of that sort got help. Are they getting help today? I don't know. But if I had to bet the farm one way or another, I would bet yes. So I will stop there and take questions. Anything you want to talk about? My guess is so that it would be, in terms of foreign policy, basically the third term of Obama. I'm not aware that she ever really violently resisted this uh, insane vision. Remember Obama, the alliance with Iran idea goes back to the presidential campaign of 2008. He started it even before he was elected. During the campaign, he sent uh, Bill Miller, uh, Ambassador Bill Miller, to Tehran to talk to the Iranians, to say to them, hey, Obama's going to win, and it's going to be wonderful. He loves you, and we're going to work together and have peace together and so forth. It's going to be fantastic. You know, they never believed it. They couldn't believe it. But it goes all the way back to there. He came in wanting that. And if you read the Ben Rhodes uh, True Confessions, uh, you will find that, that he refers to, he says that too. But it goes back to the very beginning. And uh, I'm not aware that she ever fought it. You know, if it had been me, I'd have quit because I, I wouldn't have been part of an administration that wanted to do that. That's the single craziest thing I can imagine. And uh, so I think she'll just probably go ahead with it. She'll say, well, maybe the deal we made with Iran is imperfect, but we made it and there it is, so we'll try to honor it and we'll get it enforced effectively and so forth. I don't think she'll change. And I can't imagine a Democratic president uh, sending the necessary level of military strength into places like Syria and Iraq that will really put these people down and put an end to them. And now that's only the start because then you've got the whole African theater, you've got Libya, uh, and, and it goes all the way down to countries like uh, Nigeria. You've got Congressman Wolf coming back, he'll probably bring letters saying, please put $1,000 in this bank account and we can save Nigeria. Right. <laughs> um, sorry, can't, re can't resist. Yeah, Doug. Uh, Doug Felitti, Doug Burton, I write for Burton News and News and contribute to Dash Daily. And I think, I've got to ask a basic question, which I may be the only person that doesn't understand this, but uh, the fact is that uh, you spoke more about Iran and there's only about 5% of the Muslims in the world who are Shia, and the other 95% are 
uh, Sunni. And as you know, there are many militias, I mean tens of maybe tens of thousands, maybe a hundred and twenty thousand Shia militias in Iraq who are working with the Baghdad government trying to defeat ISIS, which is a Sunni organization. So when you talk about uh, Iran, you know, being a great threat, when they're only five percent of the Muslims in the world. And the big threat that we hear about every week is ISIS who kills tens, hundreds of thousands of people. I think American people are confused, wondering how come Iran is supposedly our ally, but they're a radical Islamic state, they want a Shia Islamic state, and ISIS is a Sunni Islamic state, and you know they want their version. I mean, how do we figure this out? I, mean, I think it's very confusing for the American people, so maybe everyone else understands this, but I'd like to explain it. Yes, well, I, uh, I don't blame the American people for being confused because none of our leaders has sat down to try to explain what's going on. I mean, Iraq is easier to explain because Iraq is Shiite predominantly. So that you would have Shiite militias running around Baghdad or Hadith or Fallujah or Mosul or whatever, that's no surprise. But at the same time, and at the same time, you've got uh, 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 Muki Muqtada Al Sadr just announced, who's who commands uh, several of these uh, Shiite militias in Iraq. He's announced that he's telling his people to kill any American they see. Right. So, so what's paramount: the war against ISIS or the war against us? And the answer is the war against us, because that's their ultimate objective. We're the great Satan. ISIS is a regional nuisance, the way they see it. So I think that's the simple, the short explanation, and then you can go into all of it. I also think that the uh, Sunni-Shia uh, conflict is, uh, is overdone. I think it's overstated. They're perfectly happy to uh, cooperate as long as they're fighting somebody they both hate. Problem, problems come in when things become more stable. And the, uh, the sectarian fighting in places like Iraq is provoked by countries like Iran, still the world's leading sponsor of terror. Even the Department of State says it every single year. Right. Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Andrew Herrod. I'm an independent researcher and writer. You were talking about all sorts of interpretations of Sharia and no real sort of court fight standard. But in particular, in talking about us veiling the job, saying that, well, there's no requirement of the Quran. But I remember doing a story on Fair of Tandit, a person in the Obama administration and a woman from Kashmir, she was born in Kashmir, a Muslim woman who was criticized uh, because obviously, as you can see from photos from her, she does not veil. And she was criticized by a Kashmiri woman that according to uh, the Hadith, that uh, the norm in Islam is that you only show your face and your hand uncovered. Uh, I also met a Saudi woman who also wore the niqab, the face covering, saying that this is the way the wives of Muhammad uh, dress. She wanted to emulate them. It seems like there's <coughs> uh, consistency there. Uh, there's no consistency. There's just a huge range of variation, and it changes over time. Uh, a generation ago, uh, you would find very few Iraqi women who covered their heads. I mean, when our son went into, uh, went into Iraq 2005, not many women uh, <laughs> covered themselves. Sure. Sunni, Shia, didn't matter. And, uh, and now they do, yep. more and more of them. So, you know, so it all depends who's in charge, what imam is giving orders, who's writing the dress code this month, and so forth, uh, and and the women don't like it, and I don't blame them. 
You know, the women in Afghanistan are forever protesting about this, and women in Iran are op will openly flaunt it and uh, defy the state to crack down, which it does. Oh, by the way, just a footnote to those of you who may think that the government of Iran now is more moderate than it was under the last president, uh, executions and torture under the moderate Rouhani are up 50% compared to uh, what it was under his predecessor. And, that, and for a country like Iran, that's a lot. There's an awful lot of Iranians in prison. We, we could bring them down if we wanted to, yes. Uh, I have a, a two-part question. Please. Uh, actually, do the mosques, do the imams at the mosques have a common spiritual leader? I've heard that they're all independent, but do they have a common leader that they get guidance from? And also, <coughs> who is paying for the construction of the mosques in this country? Is it from donations of members, or is it a foreign government? No, no. In the United Saudi. States, most of the mosques are Saudi mosques. Yeah. Saudi-built mosques and the uh, books that are used in the uh, related schools are Saudi books written in Saudi uh, published by the Saudis, translated by the Saudis. Yes. Do you have any comment to make about the alliance between Muslim Brotherhood and the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, the, I would like to know more about it, but globally the, there is an alliance between radical lefties and radical Muslims. And that runs worldwide. And, and it goes back a long way. If you read uh, Khomeini, who led the Iranian revolution in 1979, he spent a lot of time studying communist doctrine, and he was very friendly and allied with the Communist Party in Iran, the Tugat Party. And uh, so he brings... Uh, he brought to the Islamic Republic of Iran elements both from communism and from Nazism. So all the racism and so forth, that's Nazi. And the structure of the party and the organization and the definition of the main enemy, us, uh, that's communist. Yeah, Michael, if I could just share an anecdote on whether Muslim women are covered or not. An American uh, Muslim I know lived in Egypt uh, for many, many years, and when he first went there, these <coughs> women weren't covered. They were out, and I'm not talking about urban settings, I'm right. talking rural settings, right. working in fields, under the hot sun, not, no problem. They, they weren't covered. And then, two decades later, they were. And what was the difference? And his answer was satellite television. Satellite television is what radicalized the practice of it and confrontation with many of the Western influences, which they found noxious, and etc. So that, I just show that comment. But my question to you concerns China and the opportunities that the Obama administration has opened for the those who see the United States as the principal object, uh, uh, um, obstacle to the achievement of their objectives. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by the utter audacity of China claiming sovereignty over the South China Sea. I mean, yes. a move that even Hitler would not have. It's, just, it's stunning. And, 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 history that a nation would make a claim that audacious. Would you fold that into your general perspective on Obama's foreign policy? Well, they're part of the gang. I mean, they're part of that alliance, the Chinese. And all of them are trying to gobble up as much as they can gobble while this wonderful man is still in the White House. Because they don't know what's going to happen afterwards. But now they can get it, they think. 
So they're pushing and pushing and pushing. And all the time we keep finding out more and more deals that Obama has made with them. And, uh, you know, why shouldn't they? They, li they live in a world, a competitive world, where strongest wins. So they want to be strongest. We used to be strongest so they didn't mess with us. Now we're running away in theater after theater. So if they think they can get away with it, they're going to do it. You know, their published military doctrine for a long time has said that Chinese defense, the goal of Chinese defense is to fight and win a war against the United States. It has said that explicitly for decades. I remember how long ago it was that I was on the China Commission, but it was true back then. I mean, that's got to be 15, 20 years. Yeah, ma'am? Michael, what, what do you think about the recent appearance of Prince Turknai bin Faisal al Saud at the big annual uh, rally of uh, the Iranian opposition and his pledge of Saudi support to the Iranian opposition National Council of Resistance of Iran for the overthrow of the regime in Tehran? I think it shows how stupid the Saudis are. Because you're not going to over, because you're not going to overthrow the regime with the MEK, and uh, and Mrs. Rajavi is not my idea of a democratic leader. So instead of doing what they should have been doing all along, the Saudis giving money to the people inside Iran. I mean, the the MEK has at best a few tens of thousands of followers inside Iran. They're not very popular. They worked with Saddam during the Iran-Iraq war. They killed a lot of Iranians. Iranians don't like them, by and large. In the meantime, you have uh, probably 70 million Iranians who don't like the regime. The Saudis should be helping the 70 million, not the few tens yeah. of thousands. You know, it's just, it's just idiotic. Idiotic. You mentioned the Kurds. Uh, if the Iraqi Kurds do declare independence in a month or two, should we recognize them? Yeah, we should. We should. We should be supporting them. We should have been supporting them all along. Uh, I'm not at all sure that the Iraqi Kurds are going to do anything as audacious as that, because they're frightened. All those people now. Who's going to save them from Iran? Who's going to protect them? The, the traditional answer was the Americans will protect us. But the Americans aren't going to protect them. The Americans are going to ask Khamenei, what do you want? And Khamenei will say, I don't want this. And so we're going to say to the Kurds, sorry, no deal. That's where we're at right now. We're in bed with the Iranians. If you want to know what we're going to do in any given circumstance uh, in the Middle East right now, just ask yourself, what does Khamenei want? What, will he, what would he tell us to do? And that's most of the time going to be the answer. Can we draw any conclusions at all about the fact that uh, the administration here, including the State Department, is taking the same stand with regard to Erdogan and the uh, so-called coup that Hamas is taking? Um, when you start talking about Turkey, you've got to ask somebody else, not me, because I don't, <laughs> I don't know enough about Turkey. Turkey confounds me, uh, and I don't really know who this guy Gulen is, uh, the one who lives in Pennsylvania, and I have no idea if any of the things that are being said about him are credible, let alone true, and so I don't know. I'm pleading ignorance. Talk to me about Iraq, Iran, Russia, China, I'll do my best there, but not Turkey. Turkey is not what I do, my, much as I love it, and uh, much as I think that uh, the three greatest cities in the world are Jerusalem, Istanbul, and Rome. And I mean, I adore Istanbul. I think Istanbul is fascinating, magical, mystical, beautiful, and so on, but I'm not going there now. Too bad. I just make a quick editorial comment that uh, Claire Lopez, who 
just ask the question about Herbie Faisal. Gave a talk here uh, a month or two ago about Gulen and the Gulenist movement. And since the attempted coup, Claire, your views of the Westminster video have shot through the ceiling. Publish it. Well, yes. she did publish it. It was based on a monograph that, uh, that Claire presented. No, no, but I mean, to, to put it in a book, get it out there, make royalties. <laughs> Be a capitalist. <laughs> You, I don't want to take you too far afield, but in case this is within your scope, can you say something about can you say something about the connection to the drug trade between radical Islam and drug trade say, in Afghanistan and uh, Mexico? Oh, you bet. It, it's one big network. It's the same network. I mean, DEA has established that. That's one of the great success stories in, in recent American intelligence. Uh, it's the same people, and uh, DEA found out quite a while back that uh, drugs move from South America to West Africa to Europe to the Middle East and so on, and then also there's another flow out of Afghanistan through Iran and across Europe coming back uh, in this direction. And it's all one big mafia. And they share facilities, and they share banking methods, and they, in some cases, share boats, little submarines, and so forth to transport the stuff. Oh, yes. The, uh, you want to do counterterrorism in this day and age, you've got to do counter-narcotics at the same time, because it's the same people. Iran makes a lot of money off of uh, drugs out of Afghanistan. A lot of money. Isn't that, what Crystal, isn't that what Crystal and Flynn were doing? Also, as part of their work in Afghanistan. Yeah, that was part of their work. That was part of their work. But uh, look, you want to win this war? We can win this war. But we have to do various things. We have to we have to go after their structures. We have to kill a lot of them, since there's no other way. And we have to attack the crazy doctrines that they put forward. We have, you know, this political correctness by which you can't uh, criticize Islam because they label you an Islamophobe or something like that. Well, why not? When we fought the Nazis, we had the best scholars in America publishing learned tomes about how evil Nazism was, about how crazy Hitler was, and so on. I mean, our, our best political scientists and historians. Today, nobody dares write any such line about radical Islam, mm -hmm. terrible though it is. We'll get there, but we've lost an awful lot of time, and we've got to attack them. I mean, when a man like, uh, like uh, General, now President al-Sisi of Egypt, stands up, at the core of Islamic uh, culture in Cairo and says, we need a reformation. We need an Islamic reformation, revolution. We have to change it because we cannot live in a world in which all the rest of the people in the world think that we, a handful of Muslims, are, are just crazed killers. That has to change. We can't have that. We have to we have to advance a a different form of of Islam, and we have to help them. We have to support those people, and some of them are uh, in charge of countries, and some of them are just uh, in local mosques, and they're frightened by the radicals. And we have to defend them, and we have to do it verbally and ideologically and politically and so forth. And all those people say we have no standing to criticize. The doctrines of Islam. You know, it all comes, they're, they're wrong. We have every right to criticize it. In fact, we have an obligation to criticize it and, and go after it. And the trouble is that, uh, excuse me if I vent in this thing, but I'm an historian. People don't know the first thing about history. I, I mean, if you ask most Americans, you know, well, what was the Reformation all about? 
They will say, well, you know, Martin Luther got up one day and he thought a lot of corruption in the Catholic Church and he tacked these things up on the wall of his church and so on. And then they argued about it and after a while it reformed. Well, never mind, there were two, three hundred years of wars over those claims that he tacked up on the wall of his church. I mean, religious wars were a commonplace in our part of the world for centuries. So, religious war today, I, uh, you know, we, we are a blessed and cursed generation because we have lived through a very, very unusual period in world history. Because from the end of World War II, at least through the end of the Cold War, and until quite recently, there were no major wars. Whereas, always in the past, with one big exception, 19th century, there were global wars in every century. And that defined the world. And so we have become the first people in the history of the world to believe that peace is the normal condition of mankind. But peace is not the normal condition. War is the normal condition. War, preparations for war, consequences of war, and so forth. That's what's normal. And we're now returning to normal. We're going back to the way it always was before you had this extraordinary period of the American century where we defeated anybody who wanted to mess with us and we said, no, we're not going to have this. Now we've got it again. Now we're back in a global war and we have to sort out how to win it. It's uh, part of the battlefield. We're fighting in Afghanistan. Uh, another one of those subjects which I think is probably a bit beyond me is Pakistan, which, is, which strikes me as a place so corrupt uh, that it's very hard to sort out who is who and what is what and whether you can rely on anybody or anything. Pakistan, I think, is a very ugly and dangerous place. And they have nuclear weapons. And uh, I spent many happy years working with Arnaud de Burgraf. He and I used to write a uh, monthly column together, monthly scoop together. So thank you for mentioning him. Hmm? Uh, yes, uh, pulling uh, from Afghanistan out of Central Asia and back to Russia. <coughs> uh, Two major countries there, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, the secession is not clear. Uh, previous attempts by penetration by Islamic radicals have been uh, somewhat contained. Uh, Russians, despite all their protestations in NATO, deep inside, I think, do know that they have a problem with the South so far. We have been pretty much doing their job for them, protecting them in the South of Afghanistan. Uh, what's your forecast? Hopefully, the British Trump administration, how much attention is going to be directed to that part of the world, especially in light of very unpredictable transition that we're facing? Look, I keep thinking the, the, the way I look at that part of the world, the, the Russian, Putin does not like radical Islam. He can't, it's threatening to him. So, I have always believed that in his heart of hearts, assuming he has one or two, uh, Putin uh, does not want Iran to succeed. And my guess is that he expected George W. Bush would take care of Iran for him. That George W. Bush would destroy Iran for him so he could make whatever <coughs> excuse me, promises he wanted to the Iranians get whatever he could from them, build uh, a nuclear power plant or two for them, but then never really 
get to the point where they were going to be a nuclear power, which he can't possibly want, in my view, of, uh, of his world. And look at all the problems he has, never mind the stands, where, yes, he has trouble. He has trouble in Chechnya still. He's still got terrorist attacks on the Chechens. So, uh, so it's a threat to him, too. And, uh, and I think that's why some of the deep thinkers, uh, uh, a la Kissinger, for example, uh, think that somehow or other in that huge pile of manure, which is relations with Russia, there's got to be a pony, namely some kind of detente, some kind of way to work things out with the uh, Russians. I'm not sure that's true, but, uh, but, you, uh, but you have to try that, it seems to me. And you certainly have to, I mean, we're going about it in the worst possible way, which is saying to Putin, what do you want? And then he says something, and we say, well, fine, you got it. What else do you want? That's our Russian policy right now. So, so Putin just has to decide how much he wants by January 20th or 21st, whenever, whatever inauguration day is. Does he want more Ukraine? He'll take it. Does he want some Estonia? He'll take that. What is it that he wants? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, my God, it, it, yeah, I'm, yeah, if I could indulge in, in maybe the last question, why was General Flynn fired or removed from DIA? General Flynn was fired because, under oath, he was asked, are we better off? Is our security better now than it was three to five years ago? And he said no. It's worse. And the president, a week before, had said we're much better off than, than we were <coughs> three to five years ago. And the president took care of it, solved that problem, had Flynn removed. Look, Flynn... The great, one of the many great things about Flynn, I'm crazy about Flynn, I mean, working with Flynn turned out to be a real treat. Flynn is a really straightforward person. There's no guile there. You ask him something that he thinks he knows about, he'll tell you what he thinks. And he may be right and he may be wrong. But he'll tell you, and he told them. And uh, the White House didn't like it, and that was the end. He's better off out on the streets with the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. It's really good. Thank you. Thank you.